So the first thing that I want to talk about is this witchcraft <laughs> that you're able to do. Producer Avery, you need to like make some sort of arrow pointing to this. It's a, it's a special thing that you can do with a bubbly can. Can you, I guess, is it just bubbly cans or could <clears throat> any can really? Really any can that has a ridge at the bottom like that. So, yeah. so most soda pop cans, anything in a can this shape. Yeah, I've never that. seen this before. My ADHD is going wild seeing it. Yeah. I'm channeling Essentially, some secret Gnostic um, tenets and beliefs to make this. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah, some secret Gnostic <laughs> things. A Avery, or James, you are so much better. You are, you are part of the elite. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I'm, what, what, essentially what you've done is you've sent in a significant portion of sparkling water that I would otherwise enjoy and put in my body to death mm. to be spilled when I <laughs> try to start pulling this off, um, in my own home. Yeah. So but, the first secret is get a full can and try it and see what happens. And then <laughs> <laughs> and see what happens. fall over. No, it's funny. It was like, I feel like. And if you can't do it, then you don't have the gnosis. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. To know if you're a Christian, if this falls over, you're doing it right. And if you have the secrets of Gnostic power, then you might be a pagan. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. The uh, Yeah, it's just gravity and, and balance and physics, I guess. That little ridge provides enough support for like two little legs there. If you get it down to like a third, it's like a middle school lunch trick or high school or something like that. Yeah. You get it down to about a third or so, yeah. maybe a little less, and you can get it to balance that way just from its own equilibrium of water weight there makes me really happy inside <laughs> um and stuff but the other thing that we did uh it was just like the it was like a cool family win for us so my family when i was younger the oldest of eight kids right so we have to figure out ways to hang out and spend time to each other in somewhat organized fashion sometimes otherwise it's chaos so we had something called family night Love it. and uh, it rotated different nights. It was mo predominantly Friday nights, and it was something that was really sacred to our family. Like so sacred that my parents, like the idea behind it is that my parents wanted it to be so awesome that you're not that upset if you miss something else yep. as a result of it. Exactly. Um, so what we would do is there would be – like there was different age groups. So there would be the little kid game. So they'd play Spill the Beans or Candyland or whatever activity. There could, it could be a game. It could be a – um, an activity of some kind that you would see in a youth group, you know, they were very board games more often than not, but you could do anything. You have the little kid one and then you had the one for the big kids where we play Monopoly or Presidents was the card game that we would play. And then there would be a special dessert that we only get on family night. Like nice. this is so like root beer floats was the most common, but there would they would go out of their way that like I don't want to miss the root beer floats, so yep. I'm I'm not going to go hang out with you, Jimmy, and go see a concert or whatever it was. Um, and then we would then we would all watch a movie together or something like that. And there typically the dinner was pizza. Um, and so I, I kind of was like, you know what, I want something like this for our family that we can look forward to, that Peter can look forward to, um, and like build a hype for. Uh, for all of us, so I kind of like instituted that, and we had our first one the other night. The cutest thing was. Um, his, the day I told him like two or three days before, Hey, we're doing this. These are the things that are going to happen. Get ready. And like, I went to the grocery store with Peter and let him pick out whatever he wanted as far yeah. as for his, for his snack. We ended up with minion popsicles. Was, there you go. It's yeah, pretty special. They, they, they weren't bad. Um, and, uh, and so we came up with different things. We ended up, he asked for us to do a science experiment. So we did the Diet Coke and Mentos thing as oh, part wow. of our deal. So, yeah. I mean, you only get one shot at it. So I spent like an hour before we started, like trying to come up with the quickest way to like shoot all the Mentos into there. Cause you don't have very long. Once you put one yeah. in, it's going to start. Yeah. Bubbling. With little kid hands, not practice. You want to find a good way. Yeah. And, um, I eventually was like, Peter, I got to do it. Otherwise it's not going to work. I should have gotten a test tube or something, but. So we do that, and he was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" And then, like Danielle prepared a craft for what us happens? to do. What happens? I've never done the trick. Does it? Does is it like it just? Do you put um, the cap on and it explodes off? Or well, you, you could do that, but really, what you do is it you you throw a whole tube of Mentos into the Diet Coke, and then it what a waste the, of the Diet Coke shoots up like ten feet into the air. Did you do this outside? Um, yes, yes, <laughs> we did it outside. Um, I was talking to someone. I was telling someone else about. It. I was like, "Oh, you're gonna have ants," and I was like, "Guys, you're missing the point of fun here, uh, bonding. You know, we'll deal with the ants. We spray, you know, and all that stuff." 
So we did that. We had like a little Danielle made. We made paper or not paper. What do you go? Pipe cleaner snakes and oh, stuff. Nice. Um, we built a we built a blanket fort and we all got in and watched the movie like Paddington. Um, nice. And uh, it was super great. But the best, honestly, the best part about it was I told Peter, Peter that two or three days ahead of time to like build up the hype for it. And his the day of his teacher comes out, Miss Robin, and says, "Dad." Peter is very excited for tonight, you know? And I was just like, come on! Yes, you did it right yeah, there. what a win! You know, yeah. and it was super great. Um, so we got to do that as a family Tuesday night. So don't That's ask so me fun. to do anything on Tuesday night. I got better plans. Nice. The other night. For the most part. Tuesday nights. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do the Friday night thing. And we probably should take a note out of your book. I like that, having some extra fun experiences. We usually do like a a fun family dinner we wouldn't normally do like pizza or something like that and uh in a movie a good movie and um we still ch the bedtime routine changes so it's usually a little later but right what we <clears throat> what we do is we usually watch like the first part of the movie and then have intermission <clears throat> and eat pizza brush our teeth put on our pajamas come back down and watch mm. so it's like that second part's like all extra time that you wouldn't normally have sort of so yeah Pretty fun. Uh, we did that with my mom when she was in town, and they were trying to think of a movie they would all want to watch, and that Grandma Nay would want to watch. And so they chose Sound of Music, which I was fairly impressed that three young boys would choose Sound of Music. And they, uh, That's very impressive. Um, and they really liked it, which honestly, like, really engaging plot when you when you watch it as an adult. Like, very Catholic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite awesome. And there's, like, a nice plot turn in the middle where you can see the attraction level building between the widower and and the maria and maria and it's uh like pretty and then there's the, like the nazi germany backdrop where he's like mm -hmm. a total austrian patriot and like having that happen which is true to the story they took some creative license but true to the story of the von trapp family um yeah really honestly as an adult really rewarding film to watch it's three hours long it though. is very long film so we didn't watch the whole thing on friday because <laughs> <laughs> we started far too late but we had steak in the middle which was pretty awesome Whoa. steak um, that yeah, I love bad. that family movie night. Your Mentos thing reminds me of work bomb, works bombs. Do you remember when those were cool? No. It's it's like works toilet bowl cleaner and like little pockets of foil. You like fold up little foil and put those in a bottle. And so you take you take you, like a empty it, water bottle. Okay. Squeeze the toilet bowl cleaner in there. Sorry, if parents, if you're listening with kids, probably stop this. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> we got high schoolers got in a lot of trouble for this. Squeeze it, and then you like roll up with some air in them little foil balls and drop them in there and the foil in the works has like a chemical reaction and it literally like it sounds like a firework maybe bigger it's that like, loud yeah and it makes so people would like do these and like toss them in a trash can at school or something <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> bad idea we maybe just, we, maybe i know what we're doing next Tuesday we did a bunch night. of them in a park but yeah i mean that's pretty cool and i think in the environment with with parents like it could be a fun little project yeah emily and i went to this thing that was hosted for a bunch of parents um and it was about how to build uh sturdy kids or resilient kids hmm. and one thing he talked about was um you gotta like set a family vision and have like boundaries so you're gonna have to have no's like maybe it's no smartphones until such an age or yeah. no sleeping over. And like, you might risk being the ostrich family that has these weird rules or whatever. He's like, but in order to have big, no, big no's or, or some no's or boundaries, you really need to have big yeses. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, so in my family, like we don't play video games, but we shoot guns and blow stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have, you have to yeah. like be engaging yeah. and exciting so, and be all in on these in, other in things. In that case, like, which Spend is more your money. fun, like going and playing paintball target practice and like real target practice at a shooting range or doing a first person yeah, playing video game or something, right? Mm. Like, eh, I mean, arguably they're both pretty stimulating, but the other one's like real. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it's, it is a big yes, or like having a boat or like where, where they'd go sail, doing sailboating or whatever, like that costs money and time and energy, but it was like a really big yes that prioritized the family time. Wow. And so I think this, your example though, of like a family night with something fun that's messy and a work and risky with the ants or whatever, right? Right. <laughs> or something that might, that might be like without a parent, not a good thing for kids to do and a little yeah. risky, mm -hmm. but yeah, it makes it really special for family life. And you have these big yeses where you do cool things. Yep. So I think that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, we really liked it. We're going to keep it. He was just like, when's the next one? I was like, next Tuesday. And he was like, 
could it be sooner? <laughs> no, <laughs> it's Tuesday. part of the fun. It, it'll be real soon. <laughs> it's part of the, it's, it's part of the buildup. You can't have it every day, you yeah. know. Um, That's so cool. So yeah, he was really excited about that. But we're not talking about the family at all today, really. No, um, not too much. So we're we're moving we're moving towards part two of our series on the book from St. Mary's Pre- or you you Mary Press, um, the religion of the day. Um, in the first part, we talked about Gnosticism, really, and just like what it was and what its core tenets were, the primal heresy being that we deny the fall and we deny that um, we deny that the evil is coming from our own hearts, but it's coming from evil, uh, yep. oppressive structures um, yep. and things, and that we're rebelling against that. Did, did you have anything else no, that just you wanted if, to add? If you hadn't listened to that one, maybe catch up on the first part of the series and then jump in. This will be, I mean, four or five parts, maybe six, just depends on how we go through it, but really great stuff. Yeah, it's going to take a while. Um, and we'd encourage you to grab a copy of the book, <clears throat> This Religion of the Day, Green Book, sequel to From Christendom, Christendom to Apostolic Mission by University of Mary. Um yeah, I think, uh, I don't know that I have a lot to add, but the the neat thing to realize, I think, for all of us is that like Gnosticism, it was here in the Greek, the Greek time pre-Christ and the Neo-Gnosticism, you know, is here now. And there's this, been this trend line where it kind of follows Christianity around because... Yeah, whenever Christ, whenever we get big, Gnosticism yeah. gets big right behind. Yeah, and so as a largely Christian nation, it makes sense that it would be kind of, uh, you know, all around our society. And the cool thing is we can see, like, here's that problem that's in the culture, maybe in the church, but, but also hey, it's in my own heart and belief system and paradigms that I view the world through. And, um, this next episode, we're really walking through the 12 aspects of this modern progressive religion yeah. and are going to get a step through that. And I think the thing I I'm excited about is this really like ugh, challenging me in my own conversion continued to Christ. Cause it's like some of these things are very similar to Christianity Mm-hmm. And then there's a slight twist, which is what the devil always does. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then some are like blatantly like in the face of <clears throat> once you're caught in the, in it. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to unpack it. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just a parasite. Yeah. You that's know, a good way to put that, it. That feeds off of similar overall backdrop in a culture and then, and then spreads like wildfire once we get to a certain point, which is where, which is where we are now. I think of whenever I think of all of these, I'm thinking of. Like everyone's watched like Louder with Crowder or, or any of these people who are like doing the change my mind mid videos on college campuses. And especially right now with all of the protests, the pro-Palestinian protests that we see on our college campuses, like where people are having like really hard conversations, whether it be about any hot topic like abortion or transgender or whatever it is, you see it. You see a lot of these things the most in some of those spots, some of these mm-hmm. tenants and you're like, wow, that's what it looks like and that's what's happening here um in some of those when those dialogues are just breaking down um i can't remember if i talked about this i might have talked about this last time i went and saw the movie civil war Uh, yeah yeah. uh anyway go see that it's a great movie it talks about what happens when we all stop having conversations with each other um Hmm. it's really good but let's dive into this first thing um the first point of the progressive religion or narcissism as we'll call it um, is the human tragedy <clears throat> of alienation. What to unpack that, James? What does that mean? Yeah, um, it's, it's really, you know, recognizing that there is a great deal of evil in the world. And I don't know, just pausing there sounds familiar. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like that, that's the, you know, kind of part of this alienation. Like yeah. there is a great evil in the world. And recognizing it as yeah. evil. Yeah. And I think that's part of why this is so attractive, actually, of a, of a belief system, because that's true. There, there is a great evil in the world. Um, and, and, and I think where, where it differs is the invitation, you know, starts to be like in my response, or I'm sorry, where it's kind of like kind of similar, but a little bit different and attractive still is like this reality of like found in euphemisms of like make the world a better place or like the bumper sticker if you're not outraged you're not paying attention like even as a christian like those kind of feel like right responses like there's we, we should make the world a better place and there are lots of things if we're paying attention that are should make us outraged yeah um and 
So it kind of follows um, Christianity a little bit um, and, and kind of breaks from the book talked about like polytheistic religions, like polytheistic religions sort of have this circle of life. Yeah. Thing, cyclic. You know, kind of like what you see in Lion King. Um, yeah. So it, stop watching Lion King, <laughs> you, you Gnostic. Are you, you, you Buddhist? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're going <laughs> to. Just, just kidding. I'll never religion. stop watching Lion King. Uh, yeah. Um, but so it, it, it actually kind of follows it in this way of thinking that the condition of the world is seriously flawed. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing that want, someone wants to do is conform to its corruption. So very interesting in that's like super similar to the tenet found in Christianity. And, and, and it's flawed, but it's almost addressing like the human, like human needs in a way, like that, that we're alienated mm -hmm. from the world, that we are struggling Mm -hmm. to like find some of the things that we need community that we're struggling to have our basic needs met, that mm -hmm. there's something that that's the evil. Yeah. Right? And that suffering exists is the, is the evil, mm -hmm. which is, which is, they don't talk about it here, but it's one part that makes this tenet different from Christianity in that like, we don't necessarily view suffering as innately evil all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, it's a part of the human condition and there's redemption to it. Um, but later we'll, kind of get into that reality but the the cure to the evil is where we where we're different but really this first tenet like i don't know that there's a lot of difference between christianity and the first tenet because i think later they talk about like where the evil is actually found right <laughs> and that's where that's, and where, that's we where we start to distinguish but separate. on its first invitation it's like recognizing this but i think the under the unmentioned thing and i don't think the book even says this in this part of the book it says it later but like the unmentioned thing is like they're just recognizing that there's evil, not recognizing where it comes from mm -hmm. or whom it comes from or who it's pointed against. Yeah, they're recognizing that there's there's a problem. There's alienation yeah. between each other. And even even so much that like they talk about like alienation from our own very selves, Yeah, um, which sounds very Christian yeah. in, in, in a sense as well, which I think is a, an important distinction to make. It's not just that there's evil, but there's like, there's like evil, there's like, I, in the way that I relate to myself is really difficult yeah. and we see it and like it, and they have to think that way with the mental health crisis that we have with all of that. Those are, those are things that are really objective that we can see. So they acknowledge mm -hmm. those things. Yeah. One, one thing I would say too, like one power in this belief system that I think we, we should kind of learn from a little bit is like to juxtapose it with like a presentation of the gospel, like a good presentation of the gospel, huh. like acknowledges the bad news, right? Like it acknowledges like mm -hmm. the human condition, the suffering it acknowledges the fall. This doesn't acknowledge the fall. Gnosticism doesn't. Um, but that's part of why it's powerful because we're, as Christians, we believe we're redeemed from something yeah, <laughs> and into something that we were designed for. And so here there's not this view that the cosmos, you know, or that God has designed us for a particular purpose, but there is this, here's the bad news and they have some good news. So yeah. it's, it's very interesting how that parallels and there is kind of this hook like recognition of the need yeah and and, and the good news we're rolling this number two is that salvation is achievable and possible mm -hmm. like that it's clear that progressive believers hold that salvation meaning escape from their state of alienation escape from suffering escape from like like utopia you know is what we're talking about here one of the things that i think in, from history that remind me the most of this is it was when communism and the uh and the cold war was in full swing and we were making those like worker utopias you know where everyone oh, was yeah. living in those boxes and they're like this is when all you live to do is work and that like and you go home and there's nothing else mm -hmm. you know that there that that peace can be found there or that the injustices of that everybody you know wouldn't be there, but we obviously knew that that wasn't the case and the Berlin Wall ended up coming down. Um, but so the promise is that if we can, that is just that it's an attainable goal, that it's something that we can do and it's something that we can do as human beings. Yeah. Which is a, which is where we start differing. Yeah. And it's powerful to your point, like to the parasite in that this very much mirrors Christianity that there, there's, there's this, there is that salvation is possible that we, we can be saved from this darkness. Mm -hmm. Um, as Christians, you know, we believe that there's a, a hope that in salvation of something no eye has seen and what no ear has heard. And that like 
will be completely healed and glorified mm -hmm. in eternity. The progressive religion's twist is that we can have that now. It's that we, we can be made perfect now, like yeah. in this, in, in reality today. If we do X, we yeah, have if we, this. if we do these things, if we push against these structures. Um, and so there's this real strong incentive, especially to, to like someone who might be really altruistic or really excited for change or transformation. There's this real promise that like with, within our own hands, we can, we can achieve a perfected state through our faith and good and goodness mm -hmm. and like self-sacrifice. And so like, yeah. that's attractive because it's kind of partially true. Yeah. Yeah. That all <clears throat> injustice would be gone and yeah. um, that everything would be equitable and that people can live that they would like to live. You know, there's a, there's a key difference in what, what we both, what, what, Christianity would define as freedom and what the Gnostics would define as freedom. Yeah, we'll get um, into that in a little bit. Yeah, yeah. and uh, diving into there. Um, but yeah, that's all really important. The third the third tenet is that there's a transformation within our humanity. So not only is it possible salvation, but that humanity completely transforms um, as a result. I think that it, that's an important thing to look at and when you look at history you know it's almost and they'll talk about that we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second but there's a there's a desire to recreate ourselves mm -hmm. in a better like in every and every new thing we learn about humans we become better mm -hmm. you know like when we're living longer than we were living 200 years ago that technological advance mm -hmm. like makes us better and what was happening before was immoral and wrong and yeah. shouldn't have been a thing you know so there's just this like progressive yeah even the cult of the body a little bit like we can be healthier and perfect and have these hacks to get ourselves to a you know ideal state yeah we know how to work out now we, yeah we know the science of yeah and not that and... that's bad per se but mm -mm. like if it's taken to an idolized place it could be the way i save myself or the way i fix myself it's interesting I shared in the first episode, the guy I met on a plane who like deeply had the religion of the day, you know, neo-Gnosticism. And it was from like a, when you really pulled back the tea leaves, it was like from a demonic source. Um, <clears throat> he kept saying to me something on the plane that was very interesting, like lots of them were euphemisms, but at the core, it was like, you are the maker of your salvation. Mm -hmm. Like you, he didn't say this necessarily. No, I think he did. Like you're God, like was the thing, was the thing. Now, Lots of us who are trapped in some neo Gnosticism ideas, like we w might not recognize that, but we'll recognize something short of that where you fundamentally deny who God is. Right. But some <clears throat> some people fully indoctrinated in this do believe, like, I'm God. And I think the interesting thing from that is, again, it is kind of partially true. And what I mean by that is, like, we're invited as Catholic Christians, as Christians in general, to be partakers in, in God's divine, div life. divine nature. And yeah. so there is. <clears throat> an idea of divinization, divination, div divination, divination. Thank you. Um, that, <clears throat> that exists within Christianity, but not the way that it's been usurped. <laughs> right. Like the Bible actually tells us that divination in the way that like Wicca, Wiccan and witches and sorcerers and whatever are trying to do is totally immoral. Um, but that's like this, it hits our, the human heart, like in a friendly way that we're invited to be, like God. And it's like really Satan's invitation to Eve. Like he just didn't want you to be like him, which is a lie. Cause he did want you to be like him. Right. <laughs> he does like, that's what he wants. That's his plan. Yeah. He wants to, um, he wants to keep this from, but you. Satan wants us to, to see, and this religion of the day, neo-Gnosticism, mm -hmm. progressive religion wants us to realize that we can attain. A, a, and as a result a, of attaining it, you are, fundamentally transformed yeah like we can go get it and grab it and make it and ourselves we're better and we're better now yeah. and you will be when you are transformed and in, in whatever this way on an individual and then society is transformed on a on an entire plane then everything everything will be better you mentioned freedom earlier like right. give me the distinction of christian view of freedom progressive or neo-gnostic view of freedom Right. The Christian, the Christian view of freedom is that we are free to do the good. And the good is something that is defined by God, by our creator. Mm -hmm. When you create something, when someone creates, 
that can of bubbly, <laughs> they define what is good for that can of bubbly. The, the, the good is that it will hold the, the bubbly and be able to be transportable and holdable and even do this cool trick. Um, <laughs> those are the good things. <clears throat> Whereas if you were to like decide to use that can as a projectile weapon, it's not it's pretty it's pretty bulky it wouldn't make a very for a very good bullet or if you were to use that as a hammer you'd probably get water all over yourself mm -hmm. like it's not designed for that purpose um so the human so the human good is to freedom to do the good with for what you're designed for which is to know love and serve god and live by his commandments and everything that jesus had we've talked about that a lot we don't have to dive into mm -hmm. that right now the 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 idea of freedom that is frankly very American sounding is just like to do whatever you want, to be whatever mm -hmm. you want to be. If I want to go, if I want to go and make a ton of money, great. Mm -hmm. You you are free to do that. If you, like if someone is free to, like this is kind of a libertarian view mm -hmm. of freedom, where like if you're if you want to go and get a, a addicted to alcohol, you are free to do so. Yeah, you know, as long as you're all, not harming someone else. Like, right, yeah. as long as you're not harming. Um, somebody else, which would be a, a key tenet of the the niceness of the gnosis. Yeah, niceness. But it's gnosis. it's a it becomes problematic because it's kind of circular in its definition, mm -hmm. right? Like if we freely determine what we will be and what freedom is, <laughs> yeah. then the definitions are all over the board of what freedom and what good is. Um, but it's really about it's more like a freedom from limits that are placed on me as opposed to like a freedom purchased by Christ, mm -hmm. like a de being delivered from other things and a freedom to be conformed to him. Um, again, like real tricky to the undiscerned eye because like the Gnostic could, you know, be like, I'm going to think about what I want to be and I'm going to become it. And the Christian understanding is like, well, sure. Like you can have a road of discipline and development and virtue to achieve the thing you're after. Yeah. Like so long as it's God's will, like, yeah, that can happen. Yeah. So like the yeah. outcomes feel sort of similar. Yeah. Virtue. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, but Virtue but, for the sake of saving yourself, bad. But the path and the life you live trying to get there become much different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. De developing <laughs> virtue as a Christian versus developing virtue as a Gnostic. Versus getting what you want. Yeah. Which, what's interesting, like, let's say they got to the same end. Like, wouldn't Satan want me to get exactly what I want? He if, would. If it wasn't subordinated to God's will. <laughs> like, you know, so it's kind of kind of tricky. Yeah, if it's not subordinating God or leading, <laughs> leading you away from it, yeah. you know? Or if, like it's a, a, if it's a distraction. Enforcing my own pride and ego. Like, yeah, actually, he'd be fine if I got something that God even wanted me for it and I attribute it to myself. I remember when I remember when we were. I think we were, it was in that Lent episode that we were talking about with uh, Father Jerome, where he kind of laid the truth bomb on us that like there's a reality that like the Lord can allow sin to exist in our lives just for the pure grace of knowing that we're sinners, yeah, and that and destroy and the destroying of our ego because if our ego got so big that we didn't even feel like we needed it and didn't sin, then it mm -hmm. would be all that much harder to like find a Lord, and which is like you know. And people talk about this with like someone who's like extremely wealthy. They have all of their material needs met. They've provided for themselves. They've been extremely successful and virtuous and mm -hmm. and in saving and doing things well, having a great job, doing everything right in the American way. Mm -hmm. That's a really like, you know, Jesus talked about it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a the, needle. I like, eye of a needle and like just rich, like, like rich people go to heaven. Like that's a that's a thing, but it's it's more difficult because the need for a savior is like yeah. I'll just have my Roomba bring it to me, yeah. you know, or, <laughs> you know, Roomba that I bought is my savior, you mm -hmm. know, in this key point. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is a, which is a wild piece within it. Um, so that there's a, there's a self-creative process. Yeah. Freedom is creating yourself um, by, by the neo-gnostic vision. And thus making you God. And the fourth, but the fourth point, like, and we've, I think we've discussed this, we discussed this a lot in the last episode, mm -hmm. so we can speed through this one a little bit more, is that the source of the alienation is not within us. And this is just like one of the very first tenets um, that's really important to understand, like the problem isn't me, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we do that with ourselves all the time. Like um, there's, 
like I can tell when someone's, you know, really trying to grow in virtue and like their first inclination, if something's gone wrong, is like, did I, what, where did I go wrong? Yeah, what here? did how I miss I, here? How could what? I grow yeah. in this area versus like saying, I really wish this person had yeah. done it this way. Yeah, it was interesting. Know? I think when we had Monsignor Shea and Archbishop on over the, the first book, uh, I think Shea attributed it to Chesterton, maybe like the Christian, <clears throat> the, the, the secular man says the problem is there out there not you know pointing away from himself and the christian man says the problem's in here mm -hmm. pointing to his heart and so here yeah number four we have a we begin to have what was similar we now have a pretty clear distinction between christian and christian thought and neo-gnostic or progressive thought yeah so we ourselves are fundamentally good within that yep. um neo-gnostic view but we find ourselves trapped mm -hmm. in these evil opp oppressive structures mm -hmm. and so we have to defeat the structures and that's how we cure the evils of everything like fatherlessness homelessness you know mental health all of it will be solved if we just are able to remove these structures and even so much like they would say that like even the family might be one of those structures based on yeah. what we're seeing right now yeah. that needs to be removed yeah um you know which we would say which is, is interesting because there is kind of a partial truth there in certain areas, but the institution of the family <laughs> is not. Like the institution of the family is really good, but like if you were to put this fourth point in like the simplest statement, Christian view is that we are fallen. Progressive neonostic view is that the world is poisoned. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like take family as a great example, like the Christian view would be like, man, as, as a world, like it began with Adam, like, the man didn't protect and keep and we began to fall in our fall nature and we've inherited some of that and so across the centuries man and woman have fallen in their responsibilities to be good parents good spouses and then the the neonostic view would say well clearly the family unit is a problem mm -hmm. and clearly that's poison and messed up we gotta we gotta dismantle that yeah um so rolling into fit the fifth point is tragic hostility, God. I don't know about you, but this is the spot where I was reading where I started to feel a bit of a gut check like for myself mm -hmm. and like the understanding of what this tragic hostility means. Like it's typically expressed not so much as like all out hatred or all out, um, or all out atheism or denying denial or anything like that. Like that's not like there are people like that. We can see those mm -hmm. people on YouTube and it, and it's uh, wildly entertaining to watch. But more so than anything, what we see is we see when that people see God as like this nice thing that really doesn't is of no consequences. There's mm -hmm. like a, a what what is the word that I'm looking for? Not a hatred, not a love. But like people say the opposite of hatred isn't love, it's uh or love isn't hatred, it's um ah, oh, what is the word that I'm narcissism? Thinking of? No, no, not narcissism. I've heard that too. Um that's an interesting Which would be one. pride. Um which would be, be pride, clear. but like dis um disinterest. Like oh, yeah. um or not dis what is Are the you word? About the difference between like apathy and no? Yeah, or apathy towards the, another yeah. person, but just like absolutely not caring. Mm hmm It's like not it. relevant. Yeah, you know, is it, the book like to quote it exactly said something like um, <clears throat> like rejecting God by uh, man? I lost it. Um, yeah, the the book said not it might not manifest as like an expressed hostility towards God, but like viewing God as kind of like harmless figure who doesn't inf interfere with my self re realization. Right. So it's sort of like yeah, kind of important, but like kind of harmless not not disruptive in my life not the center of my life certainly not lordship i'm subject to right um it's interesting to kind of share a personal story that that i see like i think this happens so where it's where, where we have if we buy into this at some level explicitly super loud or like just by our own inner logic um anything that god would ask of us that disrupts us being who we want to be like our own creative process, self-creation process is going to be something we reject yeah. as like not that important. So like one thing Emily and I have noticed and reflected on, like in the area of birth control, for example, like when Emily was on birth control, anytime the topic would come up while she wasn't hostile towards God, generally, she'd be hostile about that and like attack 
why that was wrong and here's everything science says. Yeah. As a trained medical professional, like there's some baked in answers. Um, we've noticed as we've continued to give NFP witness talks and things like that, like that same hostility when the topic comes up. So if you think about that, whether you're a man or woman and you're willingly partici participating in contraception, like being able to contracept lets me have what I want and kind of limit the resources, time, energy, money I have to spend on children. I get my life my way. Well, God's view would be, God's ask is like, trust in me. Like I will provide everything you need. And also I'm going to give you a great gift here on my timing and on my plan. Well, what we've noticed is a great hostility, even if it's just in the eye contact level and facial expressions that people we're talking to. Mm. Um, but also even like maybe, let's say when we haven't given the talk, but a priest has or something, some of the backlash and kind of scuttlebutting yeah. from the crowd of like, we shouldn't have done that. That wasn't appropriate how we did this. We're like attacking some of the semantics about how it was done. Yeah. It's like, we just really didn't like the truth that that's going to limit how I want to live life. Yeah. And so while those people weren't saying, I hate God, and while Emily wasn't saying, and I wasn't saying, I hate God, we were saying, I don't want what God asks of me. And I really don't think it matters for this area that I figured out on my own. Right. Um, yeah, and I was there's, like a, there's a pride there that I know better. And he's he's gatekeeping as a something for as me. a personal confession. We can see where this goes. Like, if earlier we accepted that I can make my own way and I can rely on myself, well, then just by that alone, we have to deny who God really is. Even if we're not, even if we love our Catholic faith, we love the tradition, the heritage, who the Father is, who Jesus is. We just changed who they are <laughs> in buying that. Yeah, you know, and, or we changed our view of who they are, right? Um, and Satan's really good at getting us to buy that in lots of different And frankly, ways. this isn't in the book, but like if our image of God shifted to a God who has arbitrary rules that like don't make sense for me and aren't good for me, and he isn't relevant, are we even going to worship that God? Like probably not eventually, because that's not God. Yeah. <laughs> that's not who he is. He's not worthy of worship, that, that yeah. image. Yeah, he's wrong um, <laughs> on these spots, so. Uh, you know what I mean? Um and mm -hmm. so I don't know, I actually, it was a few months back, but in confession, I like the sin I confess is like, honestly, I've denied that God exists as who he really is. Hmm. And like, I'm with you. Like when I reread this, I was like, yeah, that's like. Yeah, it's it, easy. It's, it's a lot easier to do than we give. Like we, we, we don't give ourselves enough credit for how Gnostic we can be about this sometimes with our, you know. Yeah, because God's not a, not a. Who God is in the Gnostic view is a limitation on who we're supposed to be, right? And so, like, if we have any of that, then then we're we're trying to break apart the oppressive structure of who we view God to be. But like, God's not that. God's a loving Father who knows a better plan for me mm -hmm. all and, the time. But there's also times within this. So that's like what's more relevant to us today, but there's been spots in history, like the French revolution is the really easy one to mm -hmm. where it gets outright hostile, you yep. know, when the, the, the priesthood got lumped in with some of the, some of the fat cats and we, they, we decided that we want a sharp, real break mm -hmm. from this and the hostility towards God became huge. And like mm -hmm. with Vol Voltaire's writings and different things like that, um, completely changing the game mm -hmm. for what, uh, for what everybody thought there. So it's an important thing to see throughout history, mm -hmm. some of these things happening. Um, and I think, I think we see some of them today. We see culturally similar things. Yeah. yeah tax on churches because of the pro-abortion kind mm -hmm. of movement, things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a very, that this part of the book, if you've got a copy and reading it, I mean, it's most of these little sections are like two, three pages. This one has a couple extra and it does like outline several historic events and it's yeah. quite quite a good read so yeah the sixth the sixth point here is that there's a high but ambiguous moral call what is ambiguous about a high moral call it's, it, it would seem like there'd have to be a prescribed set of rules to not be ambiguous right i would agree and i think it point it comes from some of the earlier parts here like even the definition of freedom right like kind of hard to have a non-ambiguous high moral call if freedom is being who I want to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. What do you, what do you think on, on this one? What would be the takeaway here? Yeah. I mean, the takeaway is, is that they're good people, people that are a part of the, the Gnostic 
movement and they have like they have morals that like they don't want to like they're trying to address the evils that we see you know they they're trying to address the different evils that are there they're just going about it in a way that Christianity doesn't agree with you know like they want to get rid of like they want to bring about you know women's rights we talked about a little bit last time that was a great thing and it was a mm-hmm. thing that needed to happen um and it was a shame that hadn't happened sooner and it was an embarrassment for the church that it hadn't happened sooner um and there's still growth to be done in in that particular area um but it, I, I think it's ambiguous because it constantly is changing. You know, can't like it makes me think of cancel culture like just a little bit. Like you can't be seen doing like if if someone who's a part of this particular religion is seen like I, I like I'm thinking of. I can't wait to watch this show. There's gonna, they're going to make a show about Donald Sterling, who's the former owner of the Los Angeles Clippers and the NBA basketball mm-hmm. team. And this guy got caught on tape by his mistress that he was super racist, like using the N-word, doing all mm. of these terrible things. This guy's super rich, has super well-connected, but got thrown out wow. of the National Basketball League, like a billionaire. For good reason. Yeah, for good reason. But, um, but and was just like, you're gone, and like nobody talks to him again. Like I, no one's ever heard of Donald Sterling ever again. Like not saying that what he did was right and everything, but like I feel like we denied him the humanness of who he is by mm-hmm. like – like not leaving room for like growth and uh, for forgiveness. Like that's something that's a part of Christianity. But to your point um, that it's ambiguous, we've never canceled Walt Disney, you know, like right. as a culture. And he was anti-Semitic. It's been written about in literature. It's like very clear. <laughs> and right. there's all sorts of other issues with some of their production now. Yeah. The line changes. Like when I try to show my son Aristocats on Disney Plus, they throw up a – a thing saying, hey, there's some characterizations in here that are evil and wrong, but right. we kept them in for the continuity of, the continuity of whatever. whatever it is, yeah. but just, just as a warning label, yeah. a disclaimer. And like, that wasn't the way it was, you know, yeah. this long ago, or you'll watch a show, like I'll watch The Office and be like, man, that joke would not fly on TV today. Yeah. You know? That's interesting. And like comedians get canceled really, really easily too for what's, pushing the boundaries. What's tricky about this one is I think that like at the outset, like name the right, name the wrong injustice that's actually wrong. Like most of the time, progressive and Christian, like we're going to label them the same, like that's wrong. Like racism is wrong. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's know, a real injustice you know, that they're attacking. Po- Poverty is an injustice. You know, you know, poor elderly care is an injustice. Like all, all these things, right? Um but it, it isn't really until towards the end of how we're solving the issue that we realize we're like pretty far apart on, often on the solution. And I think, and the book touches on this a little bit, I think it's, it seems to me that the neo-Gnostic view, we're attacking this kind of from a place of anger and hatred and mm-hmm. like uh, resentment and revenge. Like we got to win this back as opposed to a place of like love for the neighbor who's suffering. And so like, because just the beginning of the heart is wrong, while we've rightly labeled the injustice as wrong and needing some solution, Mm -hmm. it's coming from this place of winning and stamping out and eradicating instead of this place of like, I love these people and I suffer for and with them. Like, you know, it's like a, it's a focus on the problem versus a focus on a love of the person. Right, and the and the elimination of the problem. We see this most especially with the unborn, right? Mm-hmm. We see suffering as the ultimate evil, mm-hmm. right? So an unplanned pregnancy, a young woman who has a baby out of bed, wedlock, has no money, isn't going to be able to take care of this baby. This baby's going to have a harder life. Yeah, and the woman and is will. going to suffer, yeah. and the women both. will. Yeah. As, yeah, in both. Um, and, uh, and as a result, of that suffering that's there mm-hmm. justifies – removing the baby from the equation, mm-hmm. you know, in the, yeah. pro, in, the, in the pro-choice debate. And we and we see this get amplified even further when we see the suffering of the elderly. Which, like, to defend the, to, like, totally strong man the position, like, I'm going to say something that sounds really wicked, but, like, that is a solution. Yeah. Like, like if the problem is this suffering and we want to alleviate the suffering, a solution is to terminate the pregnancy or kill the baby. 
Right. That's a solution. And yeah, and they make and, ar- and they make arguments. They're and, saying that the the baby isn't suffering, doesn't feel it's not alive yet. All all these different things that we don't have time to get what's into. What's not considered in the solution is like what's most loving, <laughs> right? And, and like, is it okay to permit and coexist with some suffering? Mm-hmm. Like, it, um, and that that's a part of the human condition. Yeah, and so it keeps going farther, and like the po- being poor is suffering, and so the the whole idea is like we need to eliminate the poor and like figure out and how to change some of that stuff or the suffering of the of um, the suffering of the elderly, like they're losing their cognizance, they're losing their ability to walk and run, and that suffering is so evil that we've gotten to the point where in Canada we're euthanizing. Mm-hmm. Which which know? interesting is if if my primary worldview on all this is through the prism of like making my own self best like a view of the poor is very tilted because in some sense like the poor do affect me like this part of town that i go through or the homeless like i kind of want that problem gone like fixed like Mm -hmm. not affecting my life and my community's life or whatever right Right. as opposed to like that poor person is made in the image and likeness of god as a beloved son or daughter and i want to help like dignify their humanity <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and 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 help them out of that like it where the heart is on that could have two radically different solutions yeah and not everybody who's a, a part of the progressive faith is, is necessarily supportive of abortion and euthanasia totally. and all of that yeah. like there's it's ambiguous well yeah e- even um, you and i we've identified we we tend progressive we tend progressive or neonostic on some thoughts so like yeah you know like we wouldn't support that but we could other less hot button causes we could find ourselves denying the good of the other in an effort to solve the problem Right. Whereas love is wanting the good of the, willing the good of the other. Yeah. 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 So the, there's a very big difference there. Um, so number seven is a really important thing and it, and it, and it's similar, especially to like point five, I think, yeah. um, yeah. a lot of it is that salvation comes through human effort alone in the progressive belief, the salvation that comes through the radical reordering of the external world is brought about solely by human effort. So you can build it it can happen we can do it together if we all rise up and change whatever whatever oppressive thing Mm -hmm. is needing to be changed at the time Mm -hmm. and a lot of the time that thing can be religion sometimes that thing is the family sometimes that thing is their aristocracy sometimes that thing is um uh you know, capitalism when it, in the terms of like the Russian movement or sometimes it's the Jews and what they're doing um, within the Nazi movement. Like all of those things are, we have to destroy what is keeping us from this salvation mm-hmm. um, yep. and we can do it. Now's the time to rise up and claim the destiny that that's owed to us. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy to wait on God for the solution to problems that we think we can fix ourselves. That was a good gut punch too. Yeah. It's like, in this in this view, we just totally don't have any room for perseverance, trust, patience, humility, and like miss all that goodness for us. And it kind of puts us being trapped back in pride again. Yeah. Yeah. And for seeds like this, like Christianity is, are, is where the seeds of these types of thoughts, like this understanding of your own faults and uh, and the brokenness of the human person, like all of this and the ability to rise up because we don't like waiting. We don't like uh, having, not understanding that the Lord's timing is better mm-hmm. for us. And the idea of providence, you know, we, 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 we dove into that idea in a big time. In that one episode, we were talking about surrender um, to the divine providence. And it's just like, it's just really unintuitive Mm -hmm. in our fallen human state yeah to be reliant upon somebody else totally yeah they close this little section with a like kind of note that areas that are like now nominally christian Mm -hmm. largely and so there's this great backdrop of the fact that evil exists and salvation is possible and like what goodness is but maybe virtues waned and humility and patience and those sort of things have waned because we don't really need like day to day. We don't need a lot of patience. We have everything instant. Like I don't have to farm my own food. Like <laughs> there's not these natural reinforcements of that. Yeah. And so it's like very ripe for this because I do have the energy, the free time, the ability, the intellect, um, the connections, the resources to go make the change without waiting on God. 
Yeah. Um, and so it's like our culture in America, the culture in Europe has been ripe for a while for this type of belief to run ramp, run rampant mm -hmm. because like the same seed bed, the same fertile soil that Christianity fosters in is there and neo-Gnosticism thrives. Mm -hmm. But now we've taken out some of the other things that are good for Christianity, bad for Gnosticism, like basic virtue. Yeah. And it's just like, I mean, this mm -hmm. is just proof that we live in this culture that we talk about this so often, you Certainly. know, the, the self-reliance and everything. Um, we are heading into part eight, but this is where we're going to have to press the pause button. Um, we'll be back. Uh, for, for those of you that are excited to keep going through the seven, we're bringing Father Erwin back. He's going to be a guest on the guest on the podcast as we keep going through this book. Um, and it's great talking about all of these things with you guys. And we hope that it's been beneficial for you. But for now, this has been Red Dirt Catholics. I'm Jace. And I'm James. We'll see you next time. Take care.